<laughs> Eric's also our webmaster. He uh, designed and manages Tripod's website. And tonight, Eric is presenting Photographing the Outer Banks. <clears throat> Take it away, Eric. All right. Let me share my screen. Did that, sh did that share? Yeah, Eric, uh, look, it's looking good. OK. Um, OK, so I, as was obviously discussed um, before we all got started, um, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was realizing that um, uh, there's probably not much I could say about the Outer Banks or show about the Outer Banks that most of you guys had not already seen or done or been a part of. Um, so I wanted to make it a little broader than that um, and kind of include um, a bulk of, of my planning process, how I go about uh, planning a trip like this. Um, because it's not just about the destination. Um, and I'll admit that I am not the, uh, the best planner. Um, and even, even when we make plans, we know that they can all go to hell in a handbasket. Um, we've got 2020 to look at and uh, to realize that that's how it, you know, that that's how it can roll. Um, my friend, Jeremy, who uh, I go on a lot of photo outings with, that guy's an amazing planner. He'll send out a full detailed by the minute list of where we will be and what we'll be doing. And the first time I went with him, I got a little, I got a little bit worried um, because it was so intense that, um, I was afraid that it wasn't, it was just going to be overwhelming. I'm kind of more of a free flowing general idea kind of person. Um, but he's really, really good at um, planning and letting it roll. And uh, so a bit of his planning prowess has rubbed off. Um, not enough to probably make him proud, but um, he, uh, he'll send just a detailed list. Um, but Jeremy wasn't leading this trip. I was, so I had to try to start figuring out. And and you, we, when you start with uh, planning your trip, when I start with planning my trip, I kind of got to, I've had to come to realize what the trip is about. That it's a photo trip, but it's also serving as a vacation for my wife, um, who has a very different idea and approach. Um, her idea of vacation is sleeping in, watching some TV, getting something to eat, seeing some nice places. My idea is being out at four o'clock in the morning, waiting for the sunrise, um, set up on a beach all by myself or with something else. And while I want her to be along with me, I realize that's not the most enjoyable thing for either of us. Um, so I have to try to balance these two. <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, COVID was already in full swing this year. <clears throat> and we started planning our uh, destination, trying to figure out what we were going to do and where we were going to go and how we were going to stay safe doing it. And um, we have been kind of in the middle ground of careful. Um, we have taken precautions, stayed six feet away from people, 12 to 18 feet from other people that we don't want to be around, um, wearing our masks, doing those sorts of things. Um, the easiest way we figured to do that was we, we really like Airbnbs. Um, so we started looking at possible uh, destination places and we have this bad habit of going to very um, um, touristy areas and doing the non-touristy things. Um, and if you've ever been to Outer Banks, at least lately, you know that there's just, it's like a redneck Riviera there. Um, there's just tons and tons and tons of people all on top of each other. And uh, you add to the fact that uh, the beach is not necessarily the, our favorite place, but we went around and we, we started looking and we thought, well, let's, let's head towards the Outer Banks. And so what I normally do is I start looking for, um, I pull up a map, I start looking for interesting places along the way, um, start making decisions about how we're going to travel that. And we knew we didn't want to make the, the whole trek in one day, that there might be some other stuff. And so um, we started looking around and we settled on maybe stopping in Williamsburg for a couple of days and looking around. Didn't know what was there other than uh, the colonial stuff. <clears throat> and uh, we knew that, we also knew as we started looking at the map, it's like, oh, I've got, uh, 
I've got some friends that uh, live along that way. Um, so if you're ever down in Jackson, Ohio, there is a place called Michael's Ice Cream Shop that makes this amazing ice cream. Mm. Um, fresh ground, fresh roasted nuts, poured over marshmallow. Um, it's worth the stop. Um, it's worth going for just the day to get it and then come back to Dayton. Um, it's huge. I go down and visit my friend down there and I will, I will photograph it and send pictures to my wife and daughter just to torment them. Um, so we knew we were going to stop there if for no other reason than Michael's and, oh yeah, we have a, a friend of mine who has been a, a college friend um, for years and years and years. Um, but uh what I normally do is I will start by taking a Google map and I'll scroll in really close and I'll start looking at my path that I'm going to travel. And I'll get in really close. I'll follow the route very precisely. And I'll put in um, a variety of saved locations. Um, as you can see, this is just a sample of, of one of the maps I've made um, that shows all kinds of places that I've either been or want to been, be, um, that I'll, I'll be driving along and I'll plant, I'll just pull out my phone and plant a uh, thing so that I'll know how to come back to a place. Um, but what this does is this gives me a ton of ideas for places to shoot um, that I'll put on. I'll also start Google searching for top places to photograph. Um, I will do stuff like must see places in and I'll put the name of the location that I'm going in, stuff like that. It's just a variety of Google searches, which will begin to give me um, stuff along the route that I will be taking. Um, and that I'll be able to, to, to go back to. Um, I save every location. That, that's a possibility in the want to go. And, and then one of the key things that you'll, you'll want to do, especially as a photographer who will end up in places in the middle of nowhere, is you'll want to download that map to your phone um, because you will end up in tons of places that have absolutely no service. And so on the, the Google Maps on your phone, you pull it up, there's a, there's a way you can navigate into and hit download the map. And it will download um, those places very intensely into um, where in the places that you want to go and give you the ability to then pull it up because your GPS will work even without signal and it will plant it on a map that you've already saved on your phone in Google. Um, so it's a way of being able to get back into because um, like one of the places that we ended up stopping after Jackson that uh, we spent the night that first night was Boomer, West Virginia. Um, it's a dying or dead uh, coal town right on the edge of uh, the New River. Um, it uh, has absolutely no cell service. Uh, you, you would blink, you would miss it. It's about two blocks long um, and butts right up against the river, but we found a nice little Airbnb there that we were able to stay in for the night. And um, we had no cell signal, and I forgot to download the login code for getting into the Airbnb. Um, so remember to log that stuff in and save it because you might end up in a place with no cell service. Um, after I've made maps like this and gone through and found stuff, then what I'll do is I will pull up um, an Instagram and start searching every location that I can possibly find. Um, what that does is uh, you can search for the specific location. Um, you can see Judd's picture there in the background. He just happened to be up that day when I uh, made the image for the presentation. Um, but you can start searching for various different things in the area. And what that'll do is that will begin to give you uh, a whole bunch of crap images, but it will also begin to give you places that you can start to hunt down because you'll see images that will come up and you'll be like, ah, I want to go to that place. I want to see that. Um, what it will also do is it will give you um, two different things. It'll give you that classic shot that ends up being taken from a particular location. And I know sometimes you want to go and you want to get that classic shot, 
but also times uh, you want to go and you want to find those different angles that won't be necessarily insta worthy. Um, so like the images that were shown earlier with the waterfall where the one was on the left and somebody said, well, it'd be nice if it was on the right, then it showed it on the right. We all know that that's probably, that might've been the same photographer just working the scene. Um, and so you're able to find these locations, see what gets shot there most, and then begin to make creative decisions before you ever set foot at that location. The other thing is, is when you're on location, you can pull this feature up on your phone on Instagram, and there's a thing that allows you to search locations near me. And you might be in the moment able to find other places um, and what other people have done there and find some really cool things that, that can happen um, that you might have never have thought of. The other thing that, um, that I always do is that I mention that I do photography to the Airbnb that I'm going to. Um, when you reserve an Airbnb, you're able to say, you're able to send a messenger to the message to the host. And I usually take a moment to introduce myself and say, hey, I'm traveling with my wife, but I'm also a photographer and I'll be in the area looking for interesting things to photograph. Well, I did that this time. And uh, one of the coolest things happened was our um, our one of our host in Williamsburg said, oh, our neighbor is a wildlife photographer. And uh, so I gotten, I got a hold of Kevin. Uh, I just sent him an email saying, hey, I'm going to be in the area. Um, didn't know if you might be able to recommend anything. And um, what happened was even better than that because he sent me a list of locations. But then um, he, uh, we swapped numbers and he called me. And we ended up going out together for the day, um, hunting places that I would have never, ever, ever found on my own. Um, all because I mentioned it to our Airbnb host, and their they were their neighbor happened to be this uh, this this really good nature photographer. And in that area, it's hard not to be a good nature photographer if you're into that. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, there are. Um, in Williamsburg, I think he said it's the, the highest concentration of bald eagles in the lower 48 states. So if you go to that place in Alaska where they're all just lining the, the, the edge of the, the water, you can see them there. But um, here we were able to see just hundreds flying back and forth and back and forth all over top of us, um, along with osprey and, and just about anything else that you wanted to see. Um, and so it paid off just asking around. And, and I've even done this with people on Instagram. You, you get online, you say, hey, I'm coming to the area. Any places you would suggest? Um, you begin to build these relationships as you're planning out your trip. Um, and after you start gathering all of this information, the, the hard part is always to start making the choices um, about what you can see and how much you time you can spend. Um, you know, my, my wife is going to want to see things um, that, uh, that I am not going to be able to haul my camera around to um, or that is really going to annoy her if I spend more time photographing than, than focusing on her. Um, let me go back up here. Sorry. Um, so you start to make these choices about how much time and where you're going to go. And, and it kind of reminded me, I used to be an editor and we had this, there's this poem that, that, that talks about how um, you're, you're writing a story or an article or you're, and you, you come down to this point where you write the perfect sentence, but it just doesn't fit. And so they use the phrase, you have to be willing to murder your darlings. And there are times where there are locations and there are things that you really, really, really want to get that you are not able to get and you just got to give up on it, either because you don't have the time or because you show up and the, the, it's just not what you imagined or the weather is completely not what you imagined. Um, <clears throat> you just got to be willing to miss the shot. Um, and what you'll see on Instagram and a lot of people's stuff is that they'll go ahead and take a shot um, and it'll be okay, but it won't be the shot that they wanted. Um, and that's okay. But it's also realizing that sometimes you just, 
walk away. Um, and so then you begin preparing for the trip. Um, I, as I said, I, I take a map. I, I got all of this stuff together. Um, but as you begin to prepare for the trip, um, I am an everything in the kitchen sink kind of approach to photography. And so this is the back of my FJ um, SUV with just photography equipment. Um, and, it, and it doesn't even show the, the lower section where I've got all the, uh, um, the tripods and stuff. What I have, what I, what I ended up taking was a Nikon D850 with three different lenses, the, the 15 to 30, 24 to 70, 70 to 20. I took a D800 as a backup. I, uh, I threw in a, a D500 with my, with my 150 to 600 for the wildlife stuff. Um, I've been playing around with film. Um, so I had a Pentax K1000, a Mamiya RB67 medium format with a couple of lenses, a Bronica S2A. And, and there's a, there's a, there, there can be overload. You make choices. I make choices when I get to the location. Some people make look, uh, those choices before they ever get there. Um, some people like stripping it down and taking very little of, of anything. Um, I am an everything in the kitchen sink kind of approach. Um, I figure I can go buy new clothes at Walmart if I need to, or, or some other place. Um, but I can't go buy a new camera while I'm there or I can, but my wife won't be any happier. Um, so I bring everything that I want along, want to bring along, um, just in case. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the, the useful apps that I put on my phone before I ever get there. Um, the Autobahn eBird app. Um, I don't know if that's the next one or not. Yeah. Um, so Autobahn and eBird are two, if you're, if you're into wildlife photography, they're great play, ways to find hotspots or locate bird sightings. Um, you can create maps online to look and uh, locate um, to see if a particular bird has been seen in an area or see, uh, click on an area and see what birds have re been reported in an area and when. Um, and that's a, that's a great app also for identifying birds. Um, so you took, a, you took a picture of a bird, you don't know what it is, you can put in, well, it was small with black and it was flittering around and it'll give you a list and you can go through and, and begin to name that bird if you would like. Um, I also use iNaturalist, um, which is a great uh, tool for identifying. You take pictures of it and you load it up and it'll help you try to identify it. Um, I'll you also use Night Sky, which uh, if you've ever been out and you're looking up at the stars, um, this will you're able to hold it up and follow it around and see which stars you're actually looking at, which constellations you're looking at. Um, I'll also use uh, Lightning. Um, it's an app that lets you see uh, places that have been struck by lightning in the last few minutes. And uh, so if you're trying to get pictures with lightning in it, um, you're able to figure out where it's at and get ahead of it or behind it or however you want to, to, to try to maneuver yourself to get it into the photograph. Um, some of the other ones I found, uh, Windy um, tells you wind speed and direction. Um, and most of these are free. Um, they're really easy to, to download and to begin to work with. And I will go through most all of these for various different things as I begin to prepare, or especially while I'm in the field. Um, wind, Wendy will let you know, okay, is this going to be too strong of a wind for me to go out? Um, what am I looking for wind-wise? Um, I know a number of you use Clear Outside. Um, it's, a great, um, it's a great app for figuring out when fog is rolling in, stuff like that. Medio Earth um, has uh, cloud apps. Um, one of the one of the ones I didn't put here, but is great on the online, is Sunset.wx. Um, 
you can go at particular times of the day and it it is one of the top rated um, sunrise and sunset prediction apps um, or programs. Um, they're, they're used by all different kinds of, of people and they'll color code um, so that you can predict, okay, is tomorrow going to be a good sunset? Is tonight, or is tomorrow going to be a good sunrise? Is tonight going to be a good sunset? And obviously they miss it because it's not 100%, but they get it right more often than not. Um, and so it's a good way to, to see, is my area going to be really good with a sunset or have a possibility of a good sunset? Um, <clears throat> going to the area where uh, they're in the Outer Banks, I used a tide alert um, to find out when the tides were coming in and going out, um, which came in handy for one of my uh, shots that I'll show you later on. Um, light meter, because uh, if you're shooting film like I was, uh, sometimes you, you can carry a light meter, but if you forget it, whatever, you've got one on your phone. This one, um, light pollution map, gives you a map of the United States and tells you where it's very, very dark and where it's going to be a lot of light pollution. Um, this will be helpful, especially as you move into stuff like astrophotography. And I did a bit of that while I was on this trip um, and I'll show you those later. Um, one of the best apps, and this one costs, I think about 10 bucks. And um, I think Beth did a review of this a couple of uh, last month or the month before um, is called Photo Pills. Um, it has a planner, it has a sun tracker, a moon tracker, but what it really has is this augmented reality. Um, so you can hold your camera up, it'll turn on the camera and filter it in and you can change, you can rotate the time and even the date to see when things are gonna show up. And so you're able to stand, uh, later on I'll show you one of the, um, the um, I was at uh, one of the lighthouses, Bodie Island Lighthouse. Um, I was there at about noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, and I was able to figure out what time I needed to be there that night to get the Milky Way shot that I wanted. Um, I just stood there, held my phone up, scrolled it with my finger until I got to the time that I wanted it and um, found out that I needed to be there in that exact location at 10 o'clock at night. And it was pretty much dead on. Um, and I was able to figure out where I needed to be all because of using the augmented reality stuff in a very, very simple, fast, easy way. Um, so uh, the rest of this, what I figured I was going to do, that's kind of where it stops planning wise, um, because when I got there, um, this entire trip blew up completely from anything that I thought it would be. Um, I hadn't planned on going and spending a day with Kevin. Um, I thought he was just going to give me a list of locations, but he ended up giving me a grand tour of wandering around um, that ended up, you know, almost 2000 images deep um, from the time I, I spent with him and multiple, multiple locations. Um, it ended up, you expect that you're going to, uh, hang out in the outer banks at a beach in the summer. And you have this idea about what that's going to be like. And you get there and it's foggy, rainy haze for five to six of the seven days we were there. I got one morning and one full day of anything that resembled a beach in the summer. Um, and so you plan and plan and plan. You get it in your head what you're going to get, and then you get there, and nothing is as it seems. Um, so I got about a day and a half, um, maybe two days of stuff. And the one day that I really, really wanted the fog, um, I didn't get it. And uh, so I didn't even take a picture of what I wanted to, to actually take a picture of, which was um, the, the cypress trees in the, the middle of Matamaski uh, uh, Lake. Um, so what I figured from doing here is I just figured I would walk through the images that I took, um, and kind of explain and talk. And if there's any questions, just feel free to ask. You could have asked any time along the way. Um, 
But uh, one of the, the locations just a, a few miles uh, outside of Boomer, West Virginia, um, some of you guys have probably been here, is Cathedral Falls in West Virginia. Um, I did not have time to go over and hit New River Gorge and, and stuff like that. It was just too far away. Um, <clears throat> but this is Cathedral Falls. It's a very high falls. And you can see I brought along the, uh, the medium format RB. And I also brought along the uh, D850 for this trip. Um, this is a really nice waterfall. If you get there early, there's nobody there. And you pull into the parking lot and it's right there. Um, you, I walked you know, 25 yards maybe to the waterfall um, and then crawled around it. And so I was able to make a combination of, you know, just different, uh, this is, uh, I believe a film shot, a couple of different shots of this very high, very cool waterfall. And then, uh, <clears throat> so we, we spent the night there. I got up really early, did that, got back, packed up with my wife. We moved on to Williamsburg. And uh, then the next day is the day that uh, Kevin wanted to, to run around. And um, it's this very cool coastal area. And like I said earlier, it's the highest concentration of bald eagles uh, in the lower 48. And so... Just moments before this, there was a uh, an adult, um, I think it was a, an adult male hanging out in the tree with his juvenile. Um, and they're so used to people being around that um, I was able to get over and get close enough to have an uncropped image of this juvenile just hanging out. Um, I'm standing on the edge of the water. It's probably 50 feet from me to the tree and then it to the top. Um, <clears throat> that just kind of let me sit there and snap pictures of it. Um, hanging out over the road was, uh, of, of one area was this, um, osprey nest and, uh, it decided to run circles around, um, carry its breakfast with it. And there were, there were hundreds, uh, just hundreds upon hundreds. Um, one of the stories that, that Kevin told me while we were out shooting was that just across the James River from where we were shooting um, was an osprey nest. And he pulled up the video to show me that it was an osprey nest in the middle of the, the, this foggy area. And just all of a sudden, this bald eagle comes screaming out of the fog and snags one of the osprey and drags it off. Um, a full full size osprey being dragged off by an eagle, um, much to the chagrin of everybody who was watching on the webcam that they had set up. But that's what they had. Um, this guy posed a lot, um, made circles. Um, this is how close you could get. I was right under this guy before um, he noticed me and I noticed him. Um, and if you know anything about shooting wildlife, especially birds, um, they, they hike up their tail and they take a big dump and then they fly off. So it was a, it was a close dodge, uh, with this guy, um, cause I was right underneath him. Um, figure out where I'm at. Um, caught this guy fishing and he just flew right directly over us. Um, so tons and tons of wildlife in that Williamsburg, Jamestown, Yorktown area, um, but also a lot of, uh, um, of other stuff. These, these beautiful cypress trees growing out uh, along the edge of the water. Um, these are just a few of the iPhone snaps that I took just to kind of say, hey, this is where I'm at. But it also made for some really good time lapse um, variety of different films, uh, my D850. Just being able to, to follow along the coast and find a variety of different um, things to shoot. 
And so we spent a couple of days there and then obviously to the Outer Banks. And for those of you who have been to the Outer Banks, um, you know that it runs from Corolla and beyond um, all the way down to Ocracoke. And I think there's a place farther south. Um, but there is just a ton of, of things to photograph and uh, along the way. And, uh, but when you get there in the middle of June, you think you're thinking uh, beach town, summer, and I did not get that. Um, most of my stuff looks like this. Um, long exposure, uh, foggy, um, getting to play with the, the wave patterns and figuring out what is going on with how to make uh, different um, time lapses work as you photograph it. Um, Playing with compositions. And there's just a ton of these piers along the way. Starting to look for other compositions and play around with what's available. Long exposure stuff. <clears throat> and then I've been playing around with blending uh, landscape and uh, street photography. So I, I'm always on the lookout for people and uh, what they're doing. Um, this guy was walking his dogs, but I, I just attracted to the, the fact that he's out there in this kind of weather, um, walking along the beach and the, the following the lines of the, the waves. And, and uh, he became the subject for a little while. Um, but when you're, when you're in this kind of weather, if you've ever been to that area, um, you start to look for other stuff to do because obviously you can't you know, you're if you've ever been on a beach with rain that's driving straight sideways, you know that sand is getting in everything. You're trying to keep your camera equipment protected. Um, and so I decided to drive my FJ into the Atlantic Ocean, um, mm -hmm. which is a uh, which is a cool experience, I must say. Um, mm -hmm. Corolla Beach, just um, north of there, allows you to drive your four wheel drive um across the beaches and i had two foot waves crashing into the side of my uh fj um mm. this is a video which i won't play but um although it might play just a little bit um but these waves were coming all the way up around this house <clears throat> and well, we went, this is where we went. you were able to to go all the way into the water it was the coolest experience I think I'd ever had. But along the way, I'd stop. I'd use my truck to block the wind and the waves um, so that I could try to get other shots. Um, and then, finally, after three or four days, um, <clears throat> this is the sunrise that I got. Um, the cloud stayed high. The cloud shelf stayed high. <clears throat> so you didn't get much, but you started to get a little bit as it came over, but when I turned around, um, there was this woman just standing there, um, probably had been waiting for the sunrise as long as I had, um, standing there waiting and the, the clouds and the waves and, and just this overwhelming scene of smallness um, as you stand there and you watch, you know, watch her in this environment. And she just stood there and soaked it all in um, and she unwittingly became the subject of my photography, um, just because I enjoyed watching her enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> don't know that there are anything spectacular, but you just, you just look and you just see somebody who's enjoying the moment that she's in. Um, uh, my wife let me bring the camera along. Uh, so I started playing around with the film and the um, <clears throat> we went down to the Bodie Island Lighthouse, um, wandering around. I did film work. I did some, uh, uh, some digital stuff. Found out later that I probably should have been more careful as I walked out into this field as they have uh, venomous snakes that kind of wander around the field. They tend to hang out closer to the, to the, to the, to the areas where the reeds are and stuff, but it's still a possibility. But <clears throat> saw the pool and could not uh, resist the reflection. 
you end up wandering through. And this is about the time that I was standing there and I was using the photo pills app to try to figure out where I was going to stand because I used the light pollution map to figure out that this was a close enough area to where we were staying that we could get there. And <clears throat> um, in a decent amount of time, used the augmented reality to figure out where I needed to be at about 10 o'clock that night um, to come back and get this. And um, there's a rule with, with uh, light pollution that even if it's not the darkest place, if it's even darker south of you, that's the better place. Um, so you can find a really, really dark place, but if it's light south of you, it's not as good as a place that's okay light-wise, but really dark south of you. And this happened to be both kind of a, a really good dark place and very dark south. Because if you look at the map, um, <clears throat> and I should have put that back in here, you'll realize that it basically, the way the islands bend, this is the bend and everything south of here is just straight Atlantic Ocean until you get to Cuba. Um, and so it becomes very, very dark. Um, but I was able to wander through here. Um, <clears throat> when I got back that night, after running around doing some other stuff, uh, pulled in because I had everything in the back of my truck, I was able to, to start uh, photographing these white ibis that were just kind of fishing the pools around um, that had flooded over. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. There was a there was a whole I don't know if you call them a gaggle or what you call them um, but there was a bunch of them just kind of hanging out fishing the the tidal pools that had kind of washed in because there had been easily just six to twelve inches of rain in the 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 week or so prior to us being there and the time we were there it just was constantly uh, blowing in. So we came back that night. My wife actually joined me, um, started practicing, and I had never really done, I'd done, I'd made one attempt at astrophotography and failed miserably. It was horrible. Um, so I spent the, the day uh, before this uh, reading through everything I could possibly read through to try to figure out something on how to get a shot. <clears throat> This made it a little easier because there was a, a bathroom to the right of this that had a light on. So it lit up the, the lighthouse almost perfectly while enabling me to, to open up. And then the light spinning created these um, natural sort of rays coming off of it. Um, and then I was able to hang around and finally get um, my first ever real Milky Way shot. Um, you'll notice in the lower left of this, those are clouds with a ton of uh, lightning happening over top of the Atlantic Ocean. They never rolled in, um, but I got them in several of my shots along the edge and along the lower place. You can see the, the, the clouds and the lightning, but it stayed fairly clear where we were at. Um, I was able to stand there for quite a while um, just because, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but it's you know you probably got the shots you need, but it's just so magnificent that you just keep taking shots. Um, I did um, pano work, um, nothing compared to what some of the other people in the group have done, because um, this is my first real attempt at, at doing this. Um, but just it's just marvelous being out there at that time of night, except as Dan mentioned earlier, the salt marsh mosquitoes um, <laughs> that absolutely do not care if you are drenched in mosquito repellent. Um, it was so thick on me that it was it was just wet um, with mosquito repellent, and I would still reach down and just scrape them off on a regular basis. It was the grossest thing. And this is this is a week later, and it took me another four months to get rid of the get rid of the swelling. Um, <clears throat> so, as they say, you uh, will sometimes have to suffer for your art, um, and that's that's just one leg. I had another leg that looked just as bad or worse. I had arms and a back and a neck that all looked that way, um, but I still could not pull myself away when you're standing up in the middle of the night looking at that. 
Eric, Eric, I remember welts the size of a quarter. Yeah. Mosquitoes. Yeah, this was this was taken uh probably five to six days afterwards. Um and I was not my my wife got them bad early because she she actually went on this one and then decided she wasn't doing that again. Um, she went out with me and hers showed up early, got really, really bad, and then went away rather quickly. Mine took two or three days and then just blew up on me and then stayed for another three to four months, uh, looking like that. Um, I even, I even looked the other day just to see, and I think they're finally gone. I might have a, have a scar or something left just because they just itch. I, I can't even describe how bad that hurt. Um, but I got to see that and, uh, and I was, I was enjoying the moment. Um, so the next night, um, after the, the mosquito attack and the, the, the lighthouse stuff, uh, my wife decided she was not going back out with me. Um, and I started locating, there is, um, this shipwreck and, uh, I forget what the name of it is now. Ocean Endeavor, I think is what it's called. This is only a month in and it's already swallowed more than half. And now, let me see if I can annotate um, so that you can see this. Now the sand line is somewhere, I don't know if you can see this line, is somewhere around there. Because I looked it up just the other day. And all you can see is just this few feet of window. Um, that's how much the sand is swallowing this thing up and how quickly it is. So this, this had shipwrecked um back in may march march and it was already um just to the right of this is a four foot um post that comes up out of the the front bow and there were maybe inches of it let me see if i've got yeah so when i look at um let me do this hold on sorry Stop annotating. So you can see now this right here is a four foot post off of the bow. And so that's how far in the front of it is already sunk in um, from March, April, May, June um, was already sunk in. Um, <clears throat> there were a lot of people out there. It's obviously a popular place when you have um, you know, when you have a shipwreck like this, but um, out there hanging around with some uh, other photographers getting to play around um, <clears throat> and uh, watch. And this is where a tide, the tide alert came in. Um, in the middle of the night, you start uh, watching the, uh, there's a, an iridescent, uh, bioluminescent something hanging around in the water right around it. So as you sweep your feet through the through the water, it starts glowing and then goes away. Um, but but uh, hung around and was able to get um, another okay shot uh, from hanging around that night. And there were probably 15 to 20 other photographers out there. Um, it was kind of cool hanging and talking with them. Some of them where they were just from all over and sharing sharing ideas and stuff as you're as you're out there. How, how long do your night exposures tend to be? Do you recall any of them? Um, yeah, actually, well, I can, um, they, I, I think I ran them at 10 to 20 seconds. Um, and it, and it took me a while to figure out. So, cause I used to try to just set it to infinity and expect it to go from there, but I started pulling it up on the back screen, focusing on one star. And then after I, I kind of manually focusing it until it got there. And that seemed to work amazingly well. Uh, this one was a little bit different. You can see, um, you can see that the ship is kind of just a tad out of focus. Um, so obviously, there's still a lot for me to learn um, when it comes to this stuff. Uh, figuring out what program you're going to use and how to best uh, put that stuff into it. Um, 
I know that we have a couple of uh, photographers in the group that are just amazing with this sort of stuff. And it was nothing like that. Um, but beginning to play with that stuff and clean it up and cause you end up with a lot of noise in it uh, to be able to get that out. Uh, but yeah, about, about 10 to 15 seconds. I was surprised at how little it took and, um, and how low the ISO was as I played around with it. Um, and then I just was out there long enough that I just played around with a bunch of stuff. I have, oh, probably 1,500 to 2,000 images from each night um, just, just goofing off and trying to figure out what each thing did and what it all, um, what each part of it did to each thing. Um, but uh, just hanging around and just giving it a try. And that is realistically the last usable image I have from my trip. Um, because you get out and you find out that you want to go to Madame Askey and the image that you had in mind um, absolutely doesn't fit. Um, and you're not going to be there long enough to, to take it. Um, you, you look around and, and it actually ended up being one of those curse is a blessing sort of thing that I found more images to take because of the rain and the fog and the dankness of the of the days that we were there than I found after things got sunny um, and nice uh, that, that going out you weren't guaranteed a good sunrise um, you were taking pictures that a million other people had already taken um, you know, and, and I tend to find myself walking away from those. Um, that's one of the reasons why I use Instagram is I just look to see what the bulk of people are taking and go, I might take one of those, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to hang around taking a bunch of those. Um, because I want to try to do something slightly different. And, uh, so I ended up walking away from, you know, a ton of different shots just because I wasn't feeling it at the moment um, for what I had. Uh, so this ended up being the, the last kind of usable shot, um, that I was willing to throw up here and show you guys. So that was my trip to the outer banks and how I got there with the, with the planning and the prep and all of that stuff. So anybody any have any questions, uh, for Eric? free to uh, the main, if you're not a uh, frequent Zoom user, you need to unmute yourself, which you can do by clicking on your microphone or just uh, <coughs> touching the space bar. Okay. What was that uh, last app that you used uh, at uh, Body Island? Uh, you, you had the, uh, the Milky Way uh, next to Body Island Lighthouse. What was that uh -huh. last it's called photo pills, photo, P-H-O-T-O-P-I-L-L-S. Um, it, uh, it, it has a ton of different, and I'm not even, I don't even know all of the stuff that it even allows you to use because it, I mean, it shows you augmented reality for where the sun is gonna be, where the moon is gonna be, where the Milky Way is gonna be, and you can just hold your phone up and look at a scene and tell. Now, obviously, if I'm standing here in Dayton, I can see where the Milky Way is going to be, but I'm not going to see it. And so that's why I use the light pollution map, the LPM, uh, which I think is a free app, to, to just kind of pull up and go, okay, is it going to be dark enough for me to even begin to consider it um, and being able to take this shot here? Um, because while I can tell where the Milky Way is going to be while I'm standing in the middle of the city of Dayton, there's so much light pollution, you're never going to see it. Um, so you begin to use a couple of these in tandem with each other um, to begin to kind of make decisions about what's going what's gonna to be usable and what's not. Yeah, it, looks, it might be very handy if you want to see the sunset in a particular place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I used it. Um, I used it a while back. Um, we were, I was doing some um, 
photography for a local organization <clears throat> and we were inside of a building but there were huge windows on the sides and we knew what time we were going to be there shooting in that area and so i was able to tell okay from you know this time to this time the sun is going to be shooting directly into this window and so we're going to have to adjust all the photography that we do all by using the the augmented reality in the sun section of that map or in the sun section of photo pills and was then able to completely adjust our our schedule of where we were going to set up and how we were going to angle things because we knew where the sun was going to be and at what time it was going to be there looks like a useful app oh very much yeah it's 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 kind of like um um what is that the the photographer's ephemeris which i have but um uh, that kind of gives you a general direction from a 2d model but the augmented reality you just cannot replace that the the augmented reality you're looking through your phone as as you're scanning and it's then able to tell you where the sun is in that location um, or the milky way or the moon whatever it is that you are trying to figure out where it's at in augmented reality through the camera on your phone it's it's amazing thank you uh-huh i have a camera question uh-huh uh, when you take uh, pictures when it's dark like that do you shoot wide open um i let me let me double check for you um i don't think i did i'm trying to figure there's my i can find my so I played around a bit. Um, that's a 2.8. Yeah, I stuck with 2.8. Okay, because I remember the, um, because the Bodhi Lighthouse was far enough away from me that it could be in focus enough with the sky that it wasn't the, the um, when, you, when you start talking about depth of field, I'm sure you already know, no. It's not, it's okay. So when you start talking about depth of field, most people think of aperture only. Um, so you get the bokeh. I pull it to 2.8. I take a picture of you and it makes this creamy background. Um, but bokeh is also related to distance. So if I'm the, so 2.8 really close makes a creamy background. 2.8 farther away, not so creamy of a background. Um, so I was using 2.8 and I did learn enough to know that um, you don't change, if you're, if you're changing things to begin to overlay your images, you don't change the aperture. Um, you can change ISO a little bit, you can change shutter speed to get various things, but you don't change the aperture. That's, that's a long exposure rule, at least as I've been taught it that if you're going to begin to do multiple layer HDR um, so that you can get a broader spectrum of, of light throughout, uh, th light range throughout, um, you don't change the aperture. Mm -hmm. And so all of mine are for that night with the, the Bodhi Lighthouse seem to be set at 2.8. Um, let me see what my stuff on the other night was. Yeah, in the darker nights, I, I stuck with 2.8. I made sure I focused on a star. <clears throat> and I also watched how close I was to what it what I wanted in the foreground. Um, so that I wasn't too close to it to make it and I and I did not get it right. As you saw on that that one image that I included of the ship, the ship was slightly blurry. Um, now a lot of times people will take multiple images to expose for the ship. And then we'll take multiple images to expose for the sky and then blend all those. Um, I did a bit of that, but not as much as I could have or should have. Um, so it was a, it was not as good as um, what you'll see people like Gary do um, in the club. Um, uh, Bob, I've seen some of his stuff that's just amazing um, when you begin to overlap, but Gary just will blow your mind with the amount of computing power and stuff that he'll do with overlay where he'll do, you know, like eight to 10 hours worth of 
computer processing for one image because he's got so many image layers just coming on top of each other. I'm a bit too impatient for that, I guess. So, um, which will probably mean I won't be a good astrophotographer going forward, but you know, sometimes it's experience. Eric, if I can chime in for just a minute to answer yeah. Laura's question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a wider aperture allows you to limit your shutter time. And that's one of the main advantages is because if you have more than 20 seconds right. uh, of shutter time with a lot of uh, apertures, you see the stars move right. with that. And so that's another mm -hmm. advantage of the wider aperture. Isn't it like the, the 1 500th or the 1 600th rule, Bob? Isn't exactly. that what it's called? You take exactly, your, Eric. Yes. Yeah, you put it over like 600 and you figure out how long you can go uh, shutter speed wise. Perfect. And I, I kept it around 20 seconds was the max that I let it go. So from a lot of my shots, I kept it at 2.8, kept it at about 10 to 20 seconds and played with the ISO, though the higher the ISO I did not like. Um, so a number of darker images and then overlaid them in um, the program is called um, that I use Starry Landscape Stacker um, because I use a Mac. That was the top recommended one. Um, and I think it was like 30 or $40. And I bought it after I did the stuff. And I wish I had had it before I did the stuff because it has some recommendations for how to best take the images to put into it. Um, but I was playing around and having fun and um, just enjoying the time. Well, your, your results were great. I noticed that the stars were pinpoint, which tells me you did the right stuff. Yeah, I, I, I fought really hard because I'd done, I'd done some astro stuff before and got it completely wrong. I thought I had, you know, focused on the stars, did that. And so I, I made sure that I pulled it up on the back screen. Um, zoomed in on one star, manually adjusted until I got that star perfectly in focus. And then it, you know, left it at that because um, like I was working with a guy earlier this week who was doing some astrophotography and his, everything was slightly out of focus. Up close was out of focus. The star was out of focus. And he said, I just put it at infinity and started shooting. And that's the mistake I had made before. I put it at infinity and started shooting. And it's just not the way to go. You got to pull something up, be very specific, dial it in. Because infinity on your, on your camera is not necessarily infinity. And it's not necessarily that star. Thank you. Mm-hmm.